Hi and welcome back. I know it's been a little while and I'll talk about why at the end. But in this video, the first of two, I talk with Professor Klaus Wirth about his latest research into mitochondrial dysfunction in ME-CFS and long COVID. And at this point, I think it's wise to break down long COVID into two phenotypes, as previously identified by Professor Wirth's colleague, Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen. They're simply titled like ME-CFS and not like ME-CFS, where the distinction between them is the point at which symptoms occur after exertion. So the first one, a day later, second one, an hour later or less, uh, for simplicity's sake. For more on this subject, which is an extremely important one, I talk about it uh, in two videos, links here and in the description. The discussion in this video is most relevant for the former category, the type of long COVID that presents like ME-CFS. So, in a nutshell, characterised by fatigue and crashes after exertion, also frequently associated with cognitive dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction and pain. Sound like you? Well, keep watching, because in my personal opinion, mitochondrial dysfunction is perhaps the key to unlocking and understanding the pathology of the condition. I do need to point out in advance that the content here is actually quite complex, so perhaps isn't the most accessible, especially if you're feeling a bit fogged up. So if there's enough demand for me to do a first principles explainer with answers to questions like what the hell are mitochondria, then do post in the comments and I'll make a film just doing that. Otherwise, I do recommend watching this one perhaps twice, uh, because I had to, and obviously I actually did the interview in the first place. So anyway, hope you enjoy it and find it helpful. I was wondering if you could just give us a brief resume of your professional history and what's brought you to this point in terms of your research so far. Yes, I'm a medical doctor by background. And when I became interested in MECFS, I had uh, passed 33 years in uh, pharmacological research at Sanofi. And it was seven years ago that I heard the first time of MECFS in a TV report on a young on a young boy that became totally incapacitated and, and bedridden. And I, I made a literature research and I found a paper from Carmen Scheibenbogen in Berlin on beta-2 adrenergic receptors. And immediately I, I felt that I could understand this disease because I worked on beta-2 adrenergic receptors and I uh, performed investigations on the effect of beta-2 uh, adrenergic receptors on cerebral blood flow and skeletal muscle blood flow. So this is a matter, MECF is a matter of a mental and muscle fatigue. For both, uh, perfusion plays a strong role and beta-2 receptors too. Could you tell me a little bit about your most recent paper and your findings in it and what light they show us on the sort of the pathological mechanisms uh, which are going on uh, in long COVID and MECFS? Yeah, in the most recent paper, we collect and discuss the patholo pathological skeletal muscle findings in MECFS and long COVID. The conclusion is that the skeletal muscle, and particular its mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction, is severely disturbed. One can even see damage to skeletal muscle after exercise when investigations take place at the right time point. Electron microscopy shows mitochondrial damage. We call it now an acquired skeletal muscle mitochondriopathy. Okay, so I guess there's two parts to this. What is it that makes uh, people with MECFS and long COVID feel so fatigued? And what are we finding in the muscles when we look at people who are experiencing this? There's mental fatigue, which is probably mainly determined by blood flow. And there is muscle fatigue, which is due to disturbed blood flow as well as mere mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, so blood flow is severely disturbed in the skeletal muscle and mitochondrial function too, probably evolving from hyperperfusion. The clinical signs are, of course, the fatigue, uh, loss of force, uh, cramps, uh, pain. In the spiroergometry studies, one can find early signs of metabolic fatigue like lactate, rising lactate or uh, decreased oxygen uh, consumption, which is clearly indicative of a severe disturbance of uh, energy metabolism, which can only be due to a mitochondrial dysfunction. And indeed, uh, electron microscopic studies show that the, micro that the mitochondria are disturbed in MECFS so there's a clear pattern of uh, of damage, and and there's a damage 
uh, that occurs after one day after uh, exercising on an ergometer and, and there's, there are signs of damage and regeneration. So the conclusion is that damage and re re regeneration take place all the time and uh, the, me the damaging mechanism is exercise itself. And we assume it's via sodium loading and then and, and calcium overload. So we assume it's a calcium overload damage, which is known from from other uh, uh, yeah from other conditions. So my working theory as a patient, in terms of what it feels like for me when I do too much on one day and then I crash the next day, what it feels like to me is that I have spent too much ATP having my busy day. And my body is simply unable to replenish the levels of ATP required to make my body function normally. So the next day, my body crashes because it's struggling to service all of the body's mm -hmm. functions and organs that need that energy. Is that accurate? Is that an idea or a theory that's supported by what you've found? Um, and what do you think is causing this these crash symptoms physically in the body? Yeah, the, the crash is due to, to of course, to, to energy dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction. It, it's a damage. Uh, it, we have to explain an exercise-induced damage. And this is why it's so severe. so severe. It's not only fatigue. It's not only exhaustion of ATP. It's a real damage that limits the energy production. And this takes longer time to recover if recovery takes place at all. It doesn't take place probably in, in the most severe cases. So do we think that these crashes we have can permanently lower the baseline, at least in some people who suffer them? Yeah, we assume that with every PEM, there is a mitochondrial damage. There is sodium overload and consecutive calcium overload because the sodium-calcium exchanger reverses its transport mode at high sodium to import calcium. So there's calcium overload and it's very damaging to, to mitochondria. And this is a, a known mechanism of, of, of damage. So uh, with every PEM, there is a damage and it can be, it's repetitive. It occurs with every PEM. It's not very severe, but it repeats again and again. And it, during this uh, yeah, calcium overload, the mitochondria are damaged. And of course, in, in the long run, the pool of intact mitochondria gets lower and lower and uh, metabolism gets in, in more anaerobic, which means more lactate, more sodium overload, more damage. And regeneration can only take place from the pool of intact mitochondria. And if it's already low, regeneration would let take time, of course, long time. Long COVID and MECFS seem to be a multi-system disease where there's many things going on. Does your research suggest a, a train of causality or a path of causality between parts of the body which seem to have problems, like, for example, the immune system and consequential inflammation, uh, nervous system dysfunction and dysautonomia. We've got vascular dysfunction and poor oxygen transfer. We've got blood clotting that may be connected to that. And then obviously uh, metabolic and mitochondrial dysfunction. Do we know what's at the top? What starts this whole process? Probably uh, in our concept, MECFS after long COVID starts with a severe vascular dysfunction. Uh, there is severe capillary microvascular damage, but microvascular damage. It also there is also macrovascular damage with reduced stroke volume. Uh, it, the uh, failure of the capacitance vessels, the veins to contract, which is also, also responsible for orthostatic dysfunction. And, and this causes during exercise, this, there is no preload of the heart because these vessels do not contract properly. And then there is hyperperfusion. And so this combination of macrovascular uh, disturbance and microvascular disturbance causes very severe yeah, dysfunction. And then uh, hyperperfusion, and this is always associated with sodium loading. And sodium loading causes calcium loading. In addition, we have the other antibodies. Order antibodies against beta-2 receptors. The beta-2 receptor is so important for the function of the sodium pump. And if it doesn't fu uh, function properly, there is sodium overload and then calcium overload. So, so it's, it's a combination of uh, hyperperfusion plus order antibodies. And there are a number of uh, antibodies. New papers uh, show uh, also new antibodies and other receptors that play a role in for raising GABA, which is an anti-stress uh, transmitter. So there is a lot of stress in the brain. There is uh, 
sympathetic hyperactivity, vasoconstriction, low perfusion, and at the cellular at the mus at the muscular level, there is a dysfunction of, of the sodium handling too much sodium influx, low outflux because the sodium pump doesn't work properly for a number of reasons. And as as soon as you have mitochondrial dysfunction, there is production of reactive oxygen species, and the, those inhibit the sodium pump even more. And the sodium pump requires a lot of energy. And with mitochondrial dysfunction, there's a lack of ATP. So uh, there's a permanent uh, insufficient activity of the sodium pump, permanent sodium loading, depolarization of the, the membrane, more um, uh, excitation, sodium influx, potassium efflux, and the sodium pump is too weak to maintain the resting membrane potential, leading to always to sodium overload and calcium overload and, and damage. So there's a, a vicious a vicious circle uh, from which the patient cannot escape. Feel free at this point to go back to the startup interview and replay it at half speed, because there's a lot here to digest. Uh, my TLDR on it would be this. We're starting to see real evidence of actual mitochondrial dysfunction and an associated theory that ties in so many of the other aspects in our rogues gallery. So immune dysfunction and specifically autoimmunity, vascular pathology, so that's your microclots, poor oxygen transfer, dysautonomia, including POTS, all of which being intimately connected to this metabolic crisis. And for me, when we see the most debilitating symptoms of MECFS identifying long COVID being fatigue, PEM, and cognitive dysfunction, from where I'm coming from, the mitochondria absolutely have to be at the heart of it. In the next part, I'll be talking to Professor Worth about the wider medical implications of this research and the novel drug Metodicure, or Mito Mitodicure, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, um, which has been specifically designed to try to counter this pathology which they've observed in the research. Finally, sorry for having been away so long, I've been doing some more experiments in the quest for recovery. I'm about two weeks back now from my last one, and yes, whilst I might look like the undead, for which you can blame a lack of sleep, and also a rather significant loss of weight, um, I'm actually a hell of a lot more functional and haven't yet crashed despite exceeding my old limits several times. So fingers crossed, but I'm going to wait a little bit longer before I draw too many conclusions. In any case, uh, assuming that things don't get terribly awful in the next week or two, my next content is going to be discussing the science, the theory, and my personal rationale for extended Bukinga-style fasting as an intervention for long COVID. There will be at least a couple of videos on the subject, uh, the first one likely on the science and rationale, and the second on my personal experience, and what lessons you might be able to learn if you felt it was something you wanted to try too. Look after yourselves. Until next time.